Hello and welcome back. Ah, the late 90s and early 2000s, what a time to be alive. The rise of the internet, Playstations 1 and 2, wrestling, frosted tips, techno, the best era of Cartoon Network, the Anatomy, and of course, The Matrix, aka the most important movie of all time. I like to look at specific moments in time through David Bowie's style changes, so let's see here. Oh, oh, damn. Earth is still slaps, I don't care. Anyway, there used to be a tendency in cinema and art in general around the turn of the millennium when the internet was a strange thing to many people of using it as a lens to portray a whole bunch of cultural anxieties. A big change could be felt in the air and changes can be scary. Just look back at the whole millennium bug tobacco when people thought that all of technology would pretty much just sepook itself because the number 2000 is cursed or something. Lord, I wish. What we're looking at here today, though, is more of a fruit of the general zeitgeist. Filmmakers saw the seeds of something sinister in the internet's early stages. The same thing that could potentially unite people across the world could also be what isolated them. As we'll see, many of these ideas were, in fact, quite prophetic, seeing as this internet paranoia is still very much present, if not more so, especially now with the rise of AI, virtual reality and stuff like Neuralink. There's a lot of declinations of this paranoia of progress. Some of the main aspects that keep coming back are the blurring between reality and the virtual world, which we see in stuff like Cronenberg's Existence, Strange Days and obviously The Matrix, the Freudian nightmares generated by the physical fusion of the human body with technology, with stuff like Technolize, Evangelion or Ghost in the Shell, the possible rise of sexual perversions with a heavy emphasis on the so-called Red Rooms, something that Cronenberg already anticipated with Videodrome, but now becomes more accessible through the internet with movies like Demon Lover or Maribito. Or unhealthy obsessions with celebrities, as can be seen in something like All About Lily Choo Choo, Perfect Blue, or in the very real and infamous case of the Bjork Stalker. All of this on the backdrop of a general apocalyptic anxiety in which politics, wars and technology are all tied together. I mean, these are the years of thick. Metal Gear Solid. Again, all these themes were already somewhat present before, but now there was a newfound lucidity with which they could be explored. A paranoia-filled lucidity, if that makes any sense. But what I'm most interested in today is one specific theme, and the way it was tied with the advent of the World Wide Web. Social isolation. To my dismay, only two works of filmmaking fit exactly with what I'm trying to convey. You see, if I had to use one adjective to describe these works, it would be desolating. They deal with the very real problem of internet communication, and how it separates us while allowing us at the same time to talk across the entire world. And I'm looking for a very specific vibe here, which is probably easier to explain by showing you some very recognizable albums of those years. You know what I mean? It's not even the romantic, lust in translation kind of isolation. It's not exciting. It's somber. It has a coldness to it. It's what you'd feel exploring a ghost town. The feeling of being the last person on Earth. It's scary, but has a strange beauty to it. We can insert all these themes into the broader spectrum of digital horror, as defined in Lini Blake and Xavier Aldana's Reyes book Digital Horror, Hunted Technologies, Network Panic and the Found Footage Phenomenon. 
digital horror is more than vaguely connected to the digital techniques inherent to its production and the stylistics commanding in its look. In fact, digital horror often exploits its own framing and stylistic devices to offer reflections on contemporary fears, especially those regarding digital technologies themselves. Let's just jump into the first example, so you'll get what I mean. And you don't seem to understand. Wait, no, you don't understand. <laughs> Serial Experiments Lane is a 13-episode anime series created by Yasuki Ueda that first aired in 1998. Your first watch through might go something like this. Present day. <laughs> Present time. <laughs> It's a very slow, surrealistic and experimental anime. It chronicles the story of the eponymous Lane, a junior high girl with a questionable fashion sense, as she delves deeper and deeper into the world of The Wired, aka the internet, but spooky. It all starts with an email by a schoolmate sent after she has taken her own life. Everyone in Lane's class gets the email, so she decides to break out her old piece of shit Navi aka a PC but spooky, and read it for herself. Her dead classmate pretty much tells her she's found God in the wire. From this point on, everything devolves as Lane tries to connect more and more to the wire, and it's kind of pointless to explain exactly what happens. You better experience it for yourselves. At the start of the series, Lane is chronically incompetent with technology. And this probably mirrors many people at the time, but going forward she becomes kind of a whiz. This couldn't be replicated today without a certain sense of anachronism, seeing as we're all pretty much connected to the wired from birth. But why does she do it? Morbid curiosity and peer pressure, pretty much. Everyone keeps telling her how she needs to become connected, even her weirdo nerd father who buys her the latest Navi, worthy of a professional streamer, gleefully seeing her newfound interest in computers as her finally maturing. Now, after a few episodes, we start getting some answers, and everyone's weird behavior is kind of explained, not really. There are different possible readings, but from the get-go, the theme of teenage development and identity are fundamental in Sir Experiments Lane. Just to give you an example, while watching, notice when Lane's childish bear pajamas get swapped for this revealing little nightgown and backwards. Or look at how much screen time her stuffed animals get. Or even how the series focuses on her friend Arisu's relationship with the teacher. Lane, the anime is intriguing for its exploration of identity as a construct without a fixed, unambiguous location. As an entity, Lane, the character, is shown to simultaneously exist in many places. She exists in many places and seems to appear very different to different people. Some see her as a child, others as a grown-up, and others... Well, I don't want to spoil it for you. It ends up becoming a real one, no one, and one hundred thousand kind of situation. Except more cybernetically schizophrenic. There would be much to say on the theme of how one's personality can change between real life and virtual life. Of how someone can lose themselves in this world of parasocial relationship. Of what it means to appear. There's also other big fundamental themes that tie into it. Like that of belief in people, in God, in reality itself. But fuck all that, I want to talk about ghosts. Of digital ghosts, in fact. As a node that connects to the internet network, the computer becomes a multi-directional portal that connects to others, but also allows the spectral to come through. You see, it's not just that Lane starts losing herself in the world of the Wired, it's also the fact that the Wired starts oozing into our own reality. There's a real dimensional merge going on before Christian even thought about it. You go from thinking that Lane might be insane, to thinking that there are, in fact, ghosts coming out of computers and chasing after people, to thinking that Lane herself is a ghost, 
to asking yourself if there is really any difference between us and what we define as ghosts. We might not have reached technological singularity just yet, but look at how fast we're evolving as a species. Serial Experiments Lane puts its finger on the pulse of exactly this kind of evolution. When will we reach the point where what's online is indistinguishable and it's worth from what's in the real world? What will that society look like? Will it be cold, lonely and full of distances? One thing that really fascinates me about Lane is the fact that technology is not the culprit of our loneliness. In fact, everything feels desolating right from the get-go. When it's not expressed through words questioning the possibility of human connection, it's expressed through framing and stylistic choices. The slowness and stilted rhythm of Lane doesn't come from just its tight budget. The pace is deliberate, many visuals are metaphorical, it doesn't do all the work for the viewer. All in all, it's a certified vibe. It's definitely not perfect and it's definitely not for everybody. But if you like this kind of stuff, give it a shot. One last thing I wish to mention is this scene, where Lane's sister gets a napkin where somebody wrote The other side is overcrowded, the dead will have no place to go. This is exactly the main concept behind the next film, so it's a perfect segue. As I mentioned in my last video, Cairo is a masterful ghost movie by Kyoshi Kurosawa, released in 2001. It's gotten an American remake and apparently a Turkish one? I'll probably never stop gushing about this movie. And don't get me wrong, it's definitely not for everyone and it's not perfect. But gosh darn it, is it unique. It is very, very grey and slow. What actually made it more famous was exactly how slow a big scary scene from the movie is. You know, the one with the lady walking all weird in slow motion. What that scene hints to, broadly speaking, is that Cairo subverts many horror tropes. And I think it's better to look at it as a drama set on a horror backdrop so you don't get false expectations. The film follows our two main characters, Michi and Kawashima, as the world starts falling around them. Michi works at a greenhouse and her co-worker, Taguchi, hasn't been shown to work for about a week, so she goes to check on him. She finds him standing like a weirdo in his apartment, and when she goes to grab a floppy that he made for work, he silently hits yeah. himself using an ethernet cable. Very subtle metaphor. Later, when they check the floppy, they see weird images of Taguchi standing ominously in the dark and a face being reflected on one of the screens. Spooky! Plot B follows Kawashima, an economy student who can't stop mouth breathing for the life of him. We find him in his room trying to connect to the internet for the first time, with probably the earliest case of a joke about not reading the terms and conditions ever. And, as we can see, just like Lane, he is a bit of a boomer when it comes to computers. So, after he gets some weird, creepy screens of people sitting around and the question Do you want to meet a ghost? He rightfully shuts that yeah. shit down and starts very subtly pestering computer science students at his university. Until he recruits the help of Harue, who's all like Do you know the print screen key, you absolute donkey? So, what starts happening around our two main characters is what really matters. People start disappearing, leaving behind these ominous black shadows. The theory presented in the movie is that the afterlife has actually a finite capacity, and that, at a certain point, the ghost will have to seep into our own reality by any means necessary. And what's the easiest one? You guessed it. Computers. See the resemblance with Lane? Now, just take a moment to think about that concept. The afterlife is a finite space and it's basically so full that it's slowly bursting into our own world. That's positively terrifying. Now let's not beat around the bush. Cairo is at its core a movie about depression and loneliness. People meet these ghosts and their whole demeanor changes. They start moping around and slowly wasting away until nothing but a black stain is left. The internet is just a means to an end. The question posed by the movie is if we're ever really connected to anyone. 
and obviously the web is a perfect metaphor. This is also perfectly encapsulated in a scene where Harue goes to Kawashima's place to see his cool gamer setup and asks him if he wants to use the internet to connect to other people. And he's like, I don't know really, everyone's doing it. So she goes, well, that sucks for you, kiddo. You see, nobody's ever connected. We all die alone. Nothing really matters. And existence sucks. I learned that in kindergarten. Have you ever read Jean Paul Sartre or Albert Camus? Yeah, I didn't think so. Can I smoke a cigarette in here? Got any leftover cold coffee? Well, maybe I'm exaggerating, but it's something along those lines. Really, it's all even more tragic than I'm making it out to be. It gets especially desolating in the second half of the movie, when you realize that everybody is actually gone, and it feels like the main characters are all alone in the whole of Tokyo. You could read many metaphors into the movie, honestly. And there's a lot more to say, like how heavy the film grain is in this movie, how creepy some background characters are, how strong Kurosawa's disdain for frontal framing is. That is to say, he seems to try to shoot most scenes in an almost three-fourths point of view. And this is true for his other films too. How effective some of the sound design is. how garbage the CGI is, etc, etc. But what I mainly want you to take away from this is A. Watch the film B. Was it prophetic? Did our newfound connection actually separate us even more? Are you lonely? Isolation, anchoring, distraction and sublimation are among the wiles we use to keep ourselves from dispelling every illusion that keeps us up and running. Without this cognitive double-dealing, we would be exposed for what we are. It would be like breaking into a mirror and, for a moment, seeing the skull inside our skin looking back at us with its sardonic smile. And beneath the skull, only blackness. Nothing. Someone is there, so we feel, and yet no one is there. The uncanny paradox. All the horror in a glimpse. And underneath is creaking desolation. A carnival where all the rides are moving, but no patrons occupy the seats. We are missing from the world we have made for ourselves. Maybe if we could resolutely gaze wide-eyed at our lives, we would come to know what we really are. But that would stop the silly attraction we are inclined to think will run forever. After all that sadness, I wanted to end on a more positive and hopeful note. There's a sweet little movie from 1996 by Yoshimitsu Morita called Haru. It's about Hoshi and Haru, who meet on an online movie forum and start sending each other emails regarding their daily life. The film uses the same technique of showing the chat text on screen, just like all about Lily Choo Choo. It is very much a movie about loneliness and connection, emphasizing the former by using tons of shots from outside windows which makes the characters look like they're in a fish tank, or framing them either sitting alone or in some way separating them even when they're in the same scene together. It's also a film about grief and the ability of moving on instead of running away. At the end, without spoiling too much, it's almost the polar opposite of Lane and Cairo, because while those two explore loneliness through online connections, the takeaway seems much grimmer when compared to Haru. In this case, connecting with people through online forums and messaging appears to be a viable way of forming relationships. I'm sure that many of you have met and talked with people online who in time have really become your friends, be it through social media, forums, image boards, etc. etc. At the end of the day though, it is still framed as a means to an end. It is a useful way to not feel lonely, especially if one is scared of meeting people in person, or somehow traumatized by past events in their life. The movie hints to the fact that a real relationship still starts when two people interact in person though. You might agree, you might not, that's for each and every one of you to decide, really. So, on the theme of digital horror we still have miles of ground to cover, but for now, I'm happy with where we got. 
In an age of constant connection to the web, it is always important to ask yourself if what you're doing online has any real value to you. If it does somehow keep that existential loneliness at bay, or if, as can actually happen in many cases, it reinforces that desolating feeling, especially with things like fear of missing out and the overall fakeness of it all. It can become really depressing and heavy when you think about it too much, and the works of filmmaking we discussed today might also be depressing for some. But I like to look at emotions as a color palette, that tragic dark blue might have a unique depth to it, and that bleak and cold grey might make for a beautiful texture. You can't really paint well unless you've tried them all, right? I wanted to take one last moment to thank everyone who has watched and shared my last and first video. I really didn't expect anyone to like it, but your positive feedback really meant a lot to me. It's really nice seeing that people appreciate the thing that you put your time into, and it definitely makes me want to do it more. Talk about parasocial relationships, huh? Seeing as I have to get busy right now with my master's thesis, I'll probably take more time to make my next video. Please feel free to suggest ideas and to tell me what you'd like to see covered. I'm open to anything, really, not just film stuff. Thank you again very much, and see you, Space Cowboys. <laughs>